From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Hamish McBain, and welcome to Who Wants to Be a London Mayor? We'll see, won't we? I want to expose the fact that he'll do a consultation and then take absolutely no notice of it whatsoever. Yes, I'm really proud that I was the mayor who froze TFL affairs between 2016 and 2021. What Londoners want to see is a mayor doing his job he's required to do by statute. A series of special episodes of the Standard Podcast focusing on London's bitterly contested mayoral election. Shukran Sami Plummer, known to his family as Nung, was born on the 13th of March, 1997. I got to the door, I opened the door. There was two police officers, a lady and a man. The man came forward, he showed me his ID, and he asked, he said, are you Jessica Plummer? I said, yes. Are you Shukran Sami Plummer's mom? I said, yes. He said, we need you to come to the hospital with us. Shaquan was involved in an accident. In a special investigation, ES Magazine journalist Emma Lofhagen has examined London's long-running, devastating knife crime crisis. This is accompanied by a special video by filmmaker Edward Sprawl featuring Jessica Plummer, whose 17-year-old son, Shaquan Sammy Plummer, was stabbed to death in 2015. He left home. When he walked down the step, I followed behind him. I'm saying, no, remember to behave yourself. Remember to be a leader, not a follower. And that's when the neighbor said, come on, Jess, leave him alone. You know he's a good boy. Shaquan turned around and said to her, tell her, tell her to leave me. He waved goodbye and that was it. Martin Griffiths, lead surgeon at the Royal London Hospital's trauma unit. We look at childhood mortality that's going up in trauma. Okay, and we're seeing the visitors and visitees of injury being progressively younger as days go by, as we normalise violence in younger people. And that's, I think, something to be mindful of. The Met's PC Graham Halloran. As far as I remember, see, literally from the, the front steps of the station when I turned around, a big crowd gathered. So when the crowd parted and moved away, um, and I managed to get through, I could see what was happening. A young man laying on the floor, eyes open, unresponsive. Uh, he had a massive cut, a really big, wide open gash on his shoulder and under his left chest was just a very small scratch. And Jacob, a young Londoner who used to carry a knife. I've carried on walking with my brethren. He's turned around and as he's turned around, my guys pulled the, the knife out and tried to stab me from behind. This project was a collaboration with Hearts of Talent, a charity that empowers young people. You can read more about the investigation in ES Magazine or online at standard.co.uk. London's knife crime epidemic. And Mayor Sadiq Khan's critics say he's failed to get a grip on the scourge that casts a tragic, long shadow over the capital's young people. In this episode of Who Wants to Be a London Mayor, we'll examine the Mayor's record on crime and policing and what policies are being offered by his Conservative rival, Susan Hall. Until 2016, youth violence in the capital appeared to be falling from its peak in 2009, but then the grim numbers started climbing again. Joining us now is Anthony France, the Evening Standards crime correspondent. You've obviously been doing uh, the job for quite a long time. How long have you been doing um, it? For me, it's been uh, 32 years I've been covering 32 crime. 32 years, so you must have seen some things. Are there any that stick in your mind as particularly harrowing or difficult to report on? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, you know, still one of the most harrowing stories was the um, was the murder of Damalola Taylor in London in 2000. And um, unfortunately, his dad died um, and he became a very good friend of mine. You know, this is a 10 year old lad who was literally skipping home from uh, an after school club at his library. And he's still the youngest victim of uh, violent youth crime in London. We haven't had any other 10 year olds in that time. And you know, a, a young lad who wanted to be a doctor and actually through his legacy, the trust that was set up in his name, they have funded uh, a number of places at King's College Hospital uh, for young people who want to be doctors, want to stud study medicine. You know, so something came out of the ultimate tragedy of that. For me, in all of these cases, is the way that one single incident, one single knife crime incident can rip through families, communities. You know, one knife crime incident affects everybody, brings trauma to 
all the people who are ever connected with it, whether you're the first police officer on the scene, the first paramedic, whether you're a, a school friend, whether you're a teacher who taught that uh, young person. And that is, for me, the story that we need to get across to a lot of the youngsters who are involved in this sort of crime. So regarding uh, levels of um, violent knife crime under Sadiq Khan's leadership at City Hall, since 2016. I mean, what's the trend and how effective has he been in getting a grip on it? Well, the, uh, the Mayor Sadiq Khan um, points to a reduction in serious crime since uh, he's been in office. He says that the number of knife injuries has actually reduced. But the figures themselves show that since 2016, uh, knife crime in the capital has risen and has jumped 22% in recent months for annual figures from the uh, Office for National Statistics show. So how much accountability should the mayor take for the Met's failings? Uh, and are there any areas where he's improved things? Yeah, well, certainly in all that time or since 2016, uh, the mayor has effectively been the police and crime commissioner uh, for London. So, you know, he has been the man in charge. He's the man who sets the direction for the Met. Um, so, no, it's not all the Met's fault. He certainly bears a responsibility. And we've seen a lot of the scandals that have happened since the murder of Sarah Everard and they've all happened on his watch. Yeah so I mean that's obviously something that the other candidates for London Mayor will be bearing in mind. What do you think is needed from the candidates to drive down violent crime? Is it simply a case of more officers or are there other, other things that could be done? Well certainly if you're going to drive down crime uh, more officers is, is a very good start. It's not just officers, you've also got to tackle the causes of crime as well, whether that is um, people who, who don't have any aspirations or hope or, you know, if there's people who aren't in training or jobs or college, um, you know, so very much talked about in London is tackling the, um, the public health part of crime as well and tackling it as if it were a health emergency. What's your opinion on things like stop and search? Is it effective, not effective? Well, stop and search obviously divides opinion, but if you ask any murder victim's family about stop and search, you'll find that almost 100% will be in support of it. And I think those are the two things. It's, it's yes, your stop and search, it can be done more proactively, it can be done with more intelligence, um, but there's no doubt that it does save lives. And, you know, if you go through the ultimate tragedy, people very quickly support stop and search. But it must be done uh, in the right way. He asked if I was Jessica Plummer again, I said yes. It took a little while, and then he said to me, Shaquan died. I couldn't believe it. I said he was lying. Nung did not die. He said yes. He got stabbed. She dropped to the floor, crying, screaming, shouting, it's not real. I need to see my son. But I said to her, I'll get, I'll get you to see your son. And then I had to do probably the hardest thing I'd ever done, because... Mum just wanted to give him a cuddle. I had to physically restrain his mum from giving her that. When you tell a parent who's done all the hard yards, got that kid to adulthood, and they tell them you can't touch them because they're a crime scene, that's hard. Let's go to the ads. In part two, we'll hear more from the Standards Crime Correspondent, Anthony France. Welcome back. What do you make of Susan Hall's campaign thus far and her, specifically with, her, with reference to her policies and thoughts on crime within London? I think Susan Hall's campaign so far has been quite low-key. I think what this knife crime epidemic uh, requires is robust um, ideas and plans. It's always welcome when anybody talks about tackling knife crime, um, but we, what we really need is somebody to put you know, meat on the bones of what they're going to do if they are elected. Within the Met, how much do you think racism and misogyny is going to be an issue to voters? There's obviously been a lot of that in yeah. the press. I believe that what we will see over this election is particularly the Conservatives, um, because it's a Labour mayor, they'll make great play of the fact that Sadiq was uh, in charge during all of this. Now, the Met are 
making quite good efforts in rooting out people who shouldn't be there. And, and we've seen, you know, up to 30 misconduct hearings uh, a month being held. And we are seeing officers who three years ago probably wouldn't have been sacked for offences that they're now being dismissed for. I think among the electorate who perhaps don't study what is being done to root out corruption, it's probably a slightly bigger issue than to the politicians. But, you know, this is all feeding into confidence and trust that people have um, in the Met. And the only way of telling people about what's happening is to is to publicise what's being done. Sure. I mean, I mean, in your expert opinion, though, they are the Met are taking quite decisive action. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, the, the Met are definitely taking decisive action on this. You know, we are talking about criminals in uniform. The Met is saying quite clearly that if you're a rogue officer, you're not welcome. And in fact, to be honest, um, from the police officers that I've spoken to, nobody wants these people out of the Met more than they do. So, I mean, obviously we're hearing a lot all the time about young people carrying knives and the number of young people in London carrying knives. I mean, what broadly can be done to, to convince them to stop carrying a knife? Yeah, so a, a lot of the times when young people uh, are found to be carrying knives, they have got hold of them for protection. So something has happened, somebody has made it be known that they're going to attack them and they will carry it for their own protection. Now, the problem with that is if you carry a knife, you're more likely to, one, use a knife and commit an offence, and you're more likely to be the victim of a knife. So, in essence, young people are feeling scared, and anything that can be done to reassure them, uh, make them feel safe. I know an, a, a number of people like uh, Mark Prince, who lost his son to knife crime, is, is speaking to young people. Um, and explain to them, look, you know, it's just not the way to carry knives because of the consequences of that. Also, the, another thing that can be done as well is that the, the particularly vicious, nasty knives, these zombie knives, um, is to reduce and make illegal the sale of them. Now, you would think that they are uh, illegal, but there are certain sports shops that do sell them and people can get hold of them. And, and I think that's something that the government is looking to um, clamp down on. What do we know about the victims and the perpetrators? Well, uh, one thing about knife crime is it doesn't discriminate. There are certainly hot spots in London, but as we have seen uh, in the, this year, you know, you can have a knife crime in any part of London. We had one in one of the most expensive roads in Fulham. There is no particular profile demographic of person. However, what we do know is that there are areas, hot spots areas, and we know that people, particularly those who are under 25, uh, are more prone to being attacked. We also know that it disproportionately affects the black community. Um, and we also know that certain boroughs, like last year, Croydon, uh, for some reason, you know, one tenth of our murders happened in Croydon. They're all unconnected. Uh, and there's no reason why it will happen, but but it just it just shows the random nature. Yeah, of I mean it. that kind of makes it more scary, doesn't it? Really, the fact that it is so random and difficult to pinpoint why it's things like that happen. Yes, there are hotspot areas. There are areas that you know places like Newham, Croydon, Borough, that you 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 can see that they do have more knife crime areas. But as we as we have seen over the last four months, they can literally happen anywhere. As I said, you know one of the most expensive roads in uh, Fulham. And that's The Standard. There's more news, interviews and analysis in the Evening Standard newspaper and at standard.co.uk. Thanks for listening. We're back tomorrow at four.